you know, there's, you know, many people within church that they hear the word and they take notes and they uh, record it and they watch it. And, and yet, uh, they're missing something. Some people can know the word, the scripture, and yet live completely different than what the scripture has said. And live in their own strength, trying to do scripture. And they make even grace a law. Even make grace a law. And there, it is a law in the sense of the spiritual understanding of, of a law. A movement. But uh, Jesus said in John, uh, you know, the word that was, has been given to me about eating food. And uh, he said, my food in uh, John 4 24, or 4 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And to finish his work. Yeah. My meat, what I live on, mm -hmm. what my food is, what gives me who I am, that I take in, is the will of God. Mm -hmm. The will of God. The will of the Father. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, Where's that at, John? Just what's the verse? That, it, 4, 434, John 434, my, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, uh, he was sent by the Father. And the word says, as the Father, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And, I, and another another understanding that I, I don't believe that a whole lot of people have, and that is the power of the sent or the sending. In fact, that's what the word apostle means. Sent. Sent. When you're sent, you know where you came from, and you know where you're going. Right. And this is the will of God. The will of God is to send you. In the journey that is given to you through the Word of God, through His Word, and enlightening you, enlightening you to your who you are and what you're about. When you eat food, what what does that food do? Without eating food, you're going to you're physically and naturally you're going to die. But it becomes you. That food that you're eating becomes you because it finds it in your digestion and in your, in your intake. It begins to move into different uh, where it's needed. It has a mind of its own. It goes into you and it, you, it, you, it becomes you. Without food, you wouldn't be you. And when you eat the right things, of course, then your, your body uh, metabolizes it and moves it into life, energy, movement. Uh, you wouldn't have much of a personality if you were about to die with the life of food. You wouldn't have any mobility. You'd be laying on the, you know, waiting to just uh, cash in the chips. Hunger. The hunger uh, demonstrates the need of food. And the Bible talks about uh, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, you're going to be filled. Amen. See, and and, and God sends he he feeds the hungry, and he sends away those that are satisfied away. Why? Because the value of what is given to us is based in what the Father has done. And uh, he says this, he says, and what is the finishing of the work? Let's go to 35. It says, do you not say, do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? In other words, it's always put off as far as the will of God. 
It's always put off. Well, when I get around to it, or I get enough money, or when I do this, or what I... And when the word comes to you, even if you think it's a partial word, if you don't do it, you're deceiving yourself. That's right. And it may be a part of word that you do by faith that someone else finishes up. But it's sowing and reaping, you see. And he goes on here to say, it says, you say there's still, uh, there's, there's still four months. You say that it's, it's not going to come in. But I say, lift up your eyes and look at the field, for they're already white in the harvest. Now it was seemingly out of time that Jesus was pointing, but he really wasn't pointing to the physical harvest out there. He was pointing to the souls that were that the, the the widow that he had talked to at the at the, the, the at the water gate or at the at the well. well was bringing her whole town to him out, and he said, "Look, the field, they're coming." You see, so he, he, he made a message out of what was going on. Out of, the, out of what God was doing, he made a message out of it that would be instilled within the people. And he always did that. He made a message out of whatever was going on. And he said, look at here, look at here, look at here, look at there. Don't you know that? In other words, and he was bringing in a, 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 an understanding that they could live by by that word. He said, lift up your eyes and look at the field, for they're already right on the harvest. And he who reaps, receive wages. Now, uh, it says, and gathers fruit for eternal life. And both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. When we look at uh, what people have done in the past, we're still reaping what Abraham sowed 4,000 years ago. We're still reaping what Jeremiah has prophesied. They were reaping it, uh, they were reaping what he had sown 500 years after he had sown it. Or the prophets, because it doesn't always come in a full thing. It comes not only for you to, for the prophet to sow, but when you receive the word of God, you're to move on it, and you may do it partially, but then the, the rest of the, the, uh, the harvest is perhaps for someone else. Or you may reap what another person has sowed. See, so we, uh, sometimes unless we see the whole package, we feel like we haven't done anything. But when we move into something, whether we think we can do it or not, when we move on it in the realm of, of faith, then we're moving in the substance of things that are expected. We're moving in the substance that we cannot see, but we're doing it out of in faith based upon what has been given us. And whether we receive the whole package or not, or maybe just an inkling, maybe just a sprig coming up out of the soil, maybe just an indi one little indicator that this thing was living. But you see, it's not just for us to reap where we've sown, but it's for the others to come in and reap where we have sown, and us to reap where other people have sown. Jesus sowed his life. And we're still reaping. You see? And so these are principles uh, uh, of understanding, I believe, that is very important. That we don't, we don't neglect those things that God has given us. My meat, the way that we live and the way that we supply the, the new creation within us that we are, and He can grow up and He can move through the different facilities of our body is through, uh, through his eating of his word. Thy word was found, and I did eat them, and they became the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Yeah. Thank you. His word is his will. But, unless, but to hear his word and uh, just receive, just hear it, 
and not do it, we're deceiving ourselves. And then uh, he says, uh, he says, for in this saying is true, one sows and another reap. I, I sent you to reap for which you have not labored. Who labored? The woman at the well for her city. She, she just dropped, she just, hey, let, tell, let, let me tell you of a man that told me all about myself. And what she was. Yeah, you're not married. You you have uh, had five husbands, and the one you're living with now isn't your husband. <laughs> you wouldn't think that that was a a, a word that was so. But she she took that word instead of being mad at him because he exposed her. She went and used that to reach her whole town because she had influence. Whether and the influence might have been. A bad influence that we would call, because she was a, she was, you know, she was just about a prostitute. Yeah. But look what Jesus did. He, he, and he, and Mary Magdalene, same thing. But what great powers that these women had to touch people, because they saw them in one light, and now they see them in another light, and they say, whoa, the miracle was more pronounced because of some of the depths of, of degradation that they went into, and, and they're bad. So we've got to understand that Jesus came to those kinds of people, even though they may, may feel, we may feel uncomfortable in moving on them, but when you give a word, when you gather up some you know, what your compassion and reach out, you're going to see something happen. You're going to see a glorious thing. And so, uh, uh, when you, your food determines who you are, natural food determines you, you, a, a physical body, and nutrients you put in your mouth determine many things. How, uh, how long you live, what you look like, without it, you would die. The will of God determines how you will manifest your new creation man. My meat is to do the will of the Father. It is building who you are in Him when you take the word and begin to use it and move in it, no matter how simple it may seem, or it may not gear up to who you really believe you are, but as you do it, then there is a nutrient of the Spirit that is provided in your heart and in your life that will uh, that will bring the new create, he'll be fashioned in you more. See, and that's the way he's fashioned in us. That's the way we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He grows in us through eating of his will. His will. And when we move as simple and just an operation of movement, it does something that will establish who we are in him, in manifestation, not just in talk about, yes, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. We'll prove it. See, what the world is looking for a demonstration. And so, anyway, uh, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. When we just hear words, we don't do them, we deceive ourselves. If you, if you hear and not do your, uh, your life as man looking in the mirror, and you see your, your own natural self, it says, when you don't do the word, you're like a man that looks in the mirror and beholds what? Your natural self. But there's another mirror. And that is found in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Let's go there for a moment. I just have a few scriptures here, but, but it, it, it demonstrates something here. Uh, 3.18 says... Um, Let's see, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. 
says, uh, okay. Okay, here it is. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, we're still looking at a mirror, and in a mirror, we're looking at the glory of the Lord. And we are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that happens when we make a movement in terms of doing his will, and eating of his will. We don't behold our natural self in the mirror because when we, we behold when we behold our natural self, we're beholding, well, uh, let's see, uh, can I do this? No, you can't. Good or evil. You're, you're looking at the man of the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when you're looking at your natural self in terms of the will of God. You look at yourself, but when you look at at him and 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 in the mirror that he gives you, what happens? But we all, through unveiled face, we don't have to make a, a veil. Uh, we don't have to. He doesn't have to hide his face anymore because of the glory, because inside is the new creation that's able to see in the mirror, in God's mirror, of who we are and what we need to do and His will. Behold as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are transformed into what we see. That's what it's saying. When you look at Him. You're not looking at Him, at yourself, and what you can do with this situation. Because then you're looking at him in the in the knowledge of good and evil when you're beholding your natural self and what you can do about it. And you can do nothing really spiritual. The, the old man and the, the knowledge of good and evil man is not going to do what the tree of life can do. And we can participate in the tree of life rather than the tree of the knowledge. And some people are looking at the word, well, I don't seem to be able to do that, and so forth. Well, yeah. You're not. And so, um, 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12. Let's go there for a minute. And I, I have two more, and then I'm through here. 13. It says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect, now, sometimes we think, well, that's Jesus when Jesus comes back or so forth and so on. No, it isn't. It's when we come into, into the fullness of what God, the measure of the stature of Christ, Amen. as it is in, in Ephesians 4, 16. When the, that which is perfect has come, and it's time for the perfect to come. Amen. See? Mm. It says, for, uh, for that which is perfect has come then, that which is in part will be done away. In other words, it'll find its place in the fullness. We're not only moving in partial knowledge anymore, we're finding that partial is, is finding itself in the fullness. When you see with his eyes, when you see with the eyes of the Spirit, when he says, has come, that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I became full age, I put away childish things. That you'll never do away with the child, because that's what you have been. But you, you put away the way he sees. A child just sees his parents. He has no idea on who his parents are until he becomes a parent. Except he'd be a teenager and they know everything. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> they know more than their parents. The parents get until smarter. they become a parent. 
Yeah. And so, uh, you see, we, we only grow up into, into who we are when we're able to come to that point of understanding of who, where we are at in this picture. You see, we can't, uh, you know, we can't know the fullness until we come into the fullness. And, and, uh, and today is a day of the fullness to come. I put away child, and now we see in a mirror dimly. A child sees dimly about the adult life. And some of the, they may play. They may play dolls, and they may play house, and they may play doctor, and they may play all these things. They're looking at the adult and then trying to fashion it out, and that's fine. God put it in them to do that. But they're really not adult yet. They, they, they don't have the responsibility as adult. And so, uh, but, but now then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know as I am known. We'll know Jesus as he knows us. That brings us into maturity. Mm, I love that. See? We know Jesus as he knows us. And then when you know Jesus as you know us, you see him in the mirror and you're looking at him. And all the while, Don, I always hear people say, you'll uh, know as you are known. That's a heaven scripture. When you get to heaven, you'll be known as you're known. Yeah. They used it only for that and never gave us the full stature. Yeah. Stuff. And, it's, and that's wow. the problem. See? Wow. That's the problem. Yeah. And it says, now... I shall know just as I am known, and now abide as faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest, because faith, what does it do? It works by what? Love. Love, okay. One more scripture, and then I'm uh, through here, I think. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and we know that uh, in... It speaks about the, the fivefold ministry. There's one thing that I wanted to uh, preface about it. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It says, uh, it talks about, now this is cannot, you know, people, like you were saying about heaven being, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. But it's not talking about the perfect doesn't come when we get to heaven. That's what the apostle. That's what we call the fivefold ministry. That's working toward. Mm -hmm. It's working toward bringing the body, and we don't come into it by ourselves, because we're the body of Christ, and we've been given properties for one another. My properties belong to you. My properties belong to you. So your properties belong to me. See? Because what's within you is to bring me into a greater state of understanding of who I am. And a mind is the same way towards you, no matter where you're at. God works where you're at in terms of, of what, how you look at yourself. But I'm to look at you like I'm looking at Jesus. Amen. Wherever you're at. But that very gaze will bring you into the knowledge of who you are. If I'm looking at you after the knowledge of the, of the, of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I am, I am judging you or I'm, I'm making a determination about you that is only known by the what I've gone through myself as a man and my stuff. But when I look at you in Jesus, then I'm able to project what what he believes you to be and what he sees you as term, in terms of redemption. And the more that you enter into that reality, the more you have an understanding of who you are and that builds you up into the most holy faith. Amen. And so uh, we go on here and then it talks about, it says, for the equipping, now the, the ministry is for the equipping of the saints, the work of the ministry for the edification of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge and the knowing of the Son of God to a perfect man or a complete person to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
And that's the way we see. And when we see that, then we're able to see. We're able to see. And even though we know a situations, and we know what's good, and when a prophecy is given, then we're able to take that prophecy and, and move it into food for us to make some action within that prophecy, whether it comes from the Word of God, or whether it comes from the prophet, or whether it comes from a word of knowledge, or whatever. And you can say, well, how does that relate to me? God will show you how it relates to you, and you can, and as you move on it, you can't just put it up into your, or put it on your refrigerator. You've got to, you've got to make some movement towards it. As simple as it may be, as, as little as it can be, it still it demonstrates faith. And so, uh, amen. Take that to the bank, huh? Take it to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, Don. That's good. The, it's interesting to me that this, what happened in John 4, that Don talked about, happened at Jacob's well. Mm hmm we're reading in Isaiah in Canada about when Balaam tried to prophesy against Israel and he said, I cannot curse what God has blessed because God will not regard iniquity in Jacob nor will he find perversion in Israel. Well, Jacob is unsanctified humanity. He became Israel after he wrestled with the Lord and he limped away from that. And so God, and the only way that Balaam could see the people of God be damaged is when he told Balak to provoke them to idolatry, to get them to transgress against God. Uh, but up to that point, he said he would not regard iniquity because he knows what we're made of in our I know that in, my, in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. I tell people that all the time. They use the gift of discernment illegitimately. They use the gift of discernment to look at me and expose what God chooses to ignore. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he says, and then he said, I will not regard iniquity in Jacob. And then when the wrestling takes place, and I will not find perversion in Israel, because when the wrestling took place, that mealy-mouthed, lying, conniving little mama's boy, Jacob, came out of there as a prince of God. And so this is taking place at Jacob's well, and it's Jesus. Jacob is, is unsanctified humanity. And it said in verse 6 of John 4, it says, Jesus was wearied in his journey. Now, how many of us can identify with that? There's times we get wearied in our journey. And it was the sixth hour. Well, why does that even matter? Because six is the number of man. And the interesting thing about it is six, the glyph for the number six, is a tent stake. And it was an ancient symbol on ancient maps where a well could be found. And it is the, it's the Vav, V-A-V, the Hebrew Vav, and where the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth, the word and is the, is the letter six. God created the heavens and the Vav, the six. And so it's the number of man. Jesus said that he was the son of man. He told the, the Pharisees, he says, you love the scriptures, but every one of your scriptures, and he was talking about the Torah, every one of your scriptures point to me. And the, they knew, they understood that the central consonant of the Torah is the Vav. So what he was saying is, I'm the central consonant. I am the son of man. I am the tenth state. And what does the tenth state do? It brings the... They believed that the heavens were a firmament, like a tent. That's why they get married under a hoopah. So what he was saying is, I am the tent stake. Mm -hmm. I am where heaven and earth come together. Mm -hmm. And here he is. He's weary in his journey. But he receives sustenance from doing the will of the Father. Don said something at the very beginning of his teaching. That's the title for, my title for this session is The Power of the Sending of God. Which really speaks to me because Don is an apostle. Mm -hmm. 
and apostles are always going to talk about the sending. They're always going to talk about the sent one. And I've never heard the sending of God talked about as that's apostolic doctrine. What Don just gave us is deep revelation of the will of God that we remember we we talked about opting into apostolic culture which is they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Before the people were added to the church daily, before there were great signs and wonders, there was something they did. There was a process that produced an outcome of people being added to the church, of signs and wonders taking place. And the process was they continued daily in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread, and in fellowship rather, and in fellowship, breaking of bread, which was covenant. Not only having fellowship, but having relationships. And prayers, because if you're not praying, you're not going to be able to endure apostles' doctrine. Yeah. Your fellowship will break down into contention, and you will not have relationship. That's right. So it's like if we're going to continue the apostles' doctrine, and we're going to have fellowship, and we're going to come into relationship, it's like somebody pray. <laughs> and when they did that, then it produced signs, miracles, and wonders, the church being added to daily, and, and actually even before that, uh, it said that, they all got out of debt. They all got out of debt in a time when the economy was being crushed under an invading, occupying army, a civil war that was about to break out. Blood would run ankle deep at the center of the city and every Jew would be expelled. That was all fixing to happen. And here was this sect of people that were completely rejoicing, full of joy, out of debt, moving according to the economy of the kingdom, not the economy of man. Kind of like we look around as we see today. What's the key? We're waiting on God to put the dollop of Holy Ghost whipped cream on us that everything changes, but we don't understand. There's a process that brought that about. We tend to look at the outcome, but we don't see the process that produced the outcome. And and what Don what I see Don talking about here just speaks further to me about that. The will of God, the will of the Father is meat and drink. And he said there was power in the sending and that your food becomes who you are. Now think about that. If the will of God is our food, is our meat, then the will of God becomes the personification of who we are. Exactly. We're not just doing the will of God, we become the will of God. My meat and my drink is to do the will of my Father. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, he said, I and my Father are one. I could have a hamburger and eat that hamburger in front of you, and I and that hamburger have become one. And Jesus is saying, I'm feeding myself on the will of the Father, and it becomes who I am. And who can resist the will of God? Satan can't resist the will of God. Man cannot resist the will of God. That's the whole understanding of, uh, I was reading the Westminster Shorter Catechism, about uh, the sovereignty of God. Light reading. The self-existence of God. The sovereignty of God. The indomitable will of God that cannot be resisted. And we eat that will. It becomes who we are. And we become principalities and powers in the earth. And we begin to see everything we say and do become to be as effective as if God said it or did it. Because the will of God that we are consuming is becoming who we are. And so God feeds the hungry. You know, I think of so many songs about God feeding the hungry. What does he feed them with? He feeds them with his will. He feeds us with his will. Oh, I'm hungry. God, I'm hungry. He, he's, and then he gives us an assignment. I, I tell people that all the time in the prophetic. There's this one lady for a long time, used to consistently, about every two months, would send us a request. Please tell me about all of my latent talents, abilities, skills, <laughs> blessings, and benefits yeah, in God. <laughs> And I, I always resisted. I ignored her a couple of times, and I would resist. It's like something inside told me, don't, don't rebuke her. And then there came a time God gave me something for her, and I gave a protracted, deep, prophetic word to her that completely changed her composure. Because the Lord told me, he said, people come, here's the difference between a prophet and a psychic. A psychic comes, what's God going to do for me? And unfortunately, 90% of people that want a word from God is tell me what God's going to do for me. Tell me what God's doing. Yeah. 
But it's not like that. It's like homework. It's like going up to the teacher after class and saying, please, can I have extra homework? Mm -hmm. You're getting an assignment. Because everything God gives us, God's, I've always said God's a good, uh, he's a good giver. He's like Martha Stewart. He always wraps his gifts. And he wraps his gifts in opportunities to obey. Amen. Opportunities, assignments. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Okay, here you go. Uh -huh. That's not what I'm, that's not what I was talking about. They want to push the easy button. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, John 4.35. I love that. Say not there are yet four months. Four is the number of dominion. Four directions. Four uh, winds. There's a, you can study four. Four is a number that has to do with dominion. And we say that. When I come into my dominion, when the power of God comes, we're waiting for the dominion of God to manifest around us when it's something that we yield to. It, manif it, will, manif it will not never manifest around you or in your circumstance until it manifests in you. Seek first the kingdom of God, the will of God, the That's rule right. of God. Uh, Matthew, and of course this whole thing about say not there are four months, uh, one day, someday thinking, when my ship comes in, I'm going to do this and so. I understand that. We, we have that conversation. If money were no object. You know, that's a part of dreaming. But yet, if we dream like that, but yet there's not something taking place in our life that represents some grain of obedience that mirrors what we say we would do if we were not limited for time, limited for money, limited for health, limited for... If we're not doing it now, and we indulge ourselves in the one day, someday uh, speculation, and, and it's a form of self-deception. If you're not doing it now, that's why we've done some of the things that we've done in our meetings. We just know. We have a vision. We've had a vision of teaching people Blessing people, uh, giving bands of hundred dollar bills to them, and teaching them that there's seed for the sower and bread for the eater. And we, that's been a dream we've had. And God reproved us when we were back in Republic. God reproved us. He says, "You must do now with what you have. If you're not doing it now, you won't do it then." How many people say that? So I want you to believe with me, brother. The five dollar that, 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 that this. Financial settlement will come my way because I'm going to, I'm going to build a headquarters for your ministry when I get that. And it's like, you watch them, and when they do get it, they don't ever do what they say they, they were going to do. Very few. I've never seen anybody who made that promise. It's not that they wouldn't. Now there aren't some that do because we've heard some that do. We've heard some wonderful stories. But a lot of people. No, they're not. If you're not doing it now, and so we've done. Things that really look pathetic. Mm -hmm. But we did. We'd take little pathetic little paltry amount of money and we would give it out in our little meeting and we would say, now, some of this is bread for eating, some of it's seed for sowing. And it was laughable because it wasn't enough money to make any difference in somebody's life, but it's being obedient. In what God took us from that, the $5 in an envelope, I think it was $40 a person, to what we thought we were given 50 to each person this last time we did it, remember? It turned out to be 100 because we had twice the amount of money and half of the people, like 80 people instead of 160, and we were able to double, do a double portion. So you should do it. was amazing. You do it now. Do now, now do what you have. What you say you would do if you weren't under whatever constraint that you're dealing with. Right. Whether It's like the 1950s healing revivalists. They would say, do what you couldn't do before. Yeah. If it's get out of a wheelchair, do something you couldn't do before. And, uh, and they consistently taught that. All of the 1950s healing evangelists continually made a demand upon people to act, do something. And the ones that wouldn't do it, wouldn't get healed. I saw Warren Hunter do that in one of our meetings uh, recently. Our last one. This couple, one of them was crippled up on a, and, and the other one, and they came down and they thought he was going to feel sorry for him in the name of Jesus. But this guy ministers in Africa. He don't take no for an answer. And they tried to be like, that was like, you stole much, brother. He said, oh, no, no, you, 
What he said, wait, wait, wait. And he followed him back to their seat and pressed in. He pressed in for him. I so appreciated that. And we had Somebody we, had, we had phone calls. We had people can contact us and say, we don't like that guy. There's something wrong with something that wrong guy. With him. You know, not, because the, not the patron, the minister. Yeah, they, they, came they didn't like Warren We said, uh, you evidently don't know his ministry because he gets stuff done in Africa, but by pursuing, he goes after that devil of infirmity and he just casts it out or whatever. This person didn't like it because they didn't like oppression. So, Matthew 5, 6, I looked up hunger in the Gospels. Blessed are those who hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What is righteousness? Righteousness is entitlement. It's, it means uprightness. It means the ability to stand upright before God because of the shed blood of Jesus. That we come before God not because we're worthy, but because of his worthiness and puny does in Christ. But that, that doesn't mean anything unless it's reflected in our experience. So on a, at ground level, on a daily basis, the righteousness he imputes to us, what that means is entitlement. Entitlement to get your prayers answered. Everything you say and do becoming as effective as if God said it or did it. That uh, he, blessed are those who hunger after righteousness, they shall be filled. We're hungering after the will of God. Amen. We're in the will of God. When we're hungry for the will of God, we're going to be filled with the will of God being done in our life. But it first comes in us. Seek first the kingdom, all things will be added. We must first do the will of God. Jesus said it doesn't come with, the kingdom doesn't come with observation. We have to do something. It's what you do with what God has said. The Lord put it to me like this. He said, what you do with what God has already said is much more powerful than what you're waiting upon God to do or say. Amen. Because when you have people who can't get results, then they're trying to get you to hold on for the next word. Because there is power in the preaching of the word. But there also has to be, like the scripture says, the performance of it. And so they make promises based on hearing of the word of God that are only certified to those that do the will of God. Right. You have to do something. It's what you do. What you do with what God has already said is much more powerful than what you're waiting for God to do or say. Mm -hmm. Which is why Paul said, we're in the prophetic, he said, war with your prophecies. How do you war with the prophecy? You pray it out. You do it. How can I align myself with this? Not every word has a is a proceeding word. Is go do something. But the ones that are, we should be pressing into. Mm -hmm. And I know for ourselves, as we have done that, as we have done that, it's like getting on a, a subway and it starts out where it's not going very fast and all of a sudden you couldn't catch up with it if you were running after it. Just takes off. It just takes off with you and you're and you're grabbing that pole and, to hold and it's going like this. And yeah. You decide, okay, <laughs> hold on, fasten your seatbelt. And that's when it gets fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> We've been living in fun. Uh, Luke six twenty one <laughs> says, Those that hunger shall be filled. If the hunger, if Jesus said the 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 hunger is the will of God, what are we gonna get filled with? The will of God. Amen. But, but do we reject what he offers to fill us with? We're hungry. Oh, God! Okay, here's your assignment. That wasn't what I was waiting for. I got enough. I, I, you know, I got all this on my plate. And as we don't see it, we see ourselves as consumers of the ministry rather than producers of the ministry. And we, we're always wanting it to, to flow this direction without understanding where the things that we have been taught to hope for as hearers of the word only come as we are doers of the word. Amen. What are we filled with? We're filled with an assignment, an overture. Do this. Be this. See, again, it's in the sending. The power is in the sending. To do the will of him whom he hath sent. See, what has God sent you to do? It's the, an, an apostle is not just to be an apostle for us. An apostle is to connect us with the sending of God. Everybody's got a sending of God. God is sending you to be a deacon. God has sent you. God has brought you into, the, into this, this circumstance of life. There is a sending of God. And when that becomes, it becomes you, what fills you, you, you suddenly get, you get um, maxed out. You get, you get your tank topped. When you begin to act on it, suddenly it fills your life. And, and, as, and as it fills your life, it's, it's the blessing that 
to overflowing. Right. More than you could ever ask or think. More than you can contain. What is it you can't contain? When the will of God fills your life and spills out, I think that's Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom. When seeking the kingdom fills who you are to capacity and, and bubbles out over you, it manifests as all things. In you, it's the doing of the will of God. Bubbling out of you, it becomes all things being added. It's the same thing. It's all the will of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, woe to you that are full. So I, I got enough on my plate. I can't be a deacon. I got enough on my plate. I got enough to do. I don't have room for that. Or I can't. And this is all I can handle. I've had enough. You don't know what my life's like. And doesn't the enemy conspire to crowd out opportunity for us uh -huh. to not do? To engage in the very process that produces the thing we're crying out yeah. for. And of course, we don't know much about being discipled because most leaders don't have the courage to disciple us. Because we haven't been taught. We've been taught to be consumers of the ministry, not producers of the ministry. People don't go to church. Let me, let me, let me go be discipled. Let me go be provoked to do something. To do, do, be. Wow. That's not what we go there for. Yeah. <laughs> but Jesus said, go make disciples. And actually he said, make disciples of all nations. And the prodigal, Luke 15, 17. He said, my father's hired servants have full bellies. I will arrive. He said, my, ser my father's servants have full be bellies and I perish with hunger. <laughs> Think about it. He said, I will arise and go. How do you arise and go? By... Uh, regret by expressions of penitence and regret. Well, I believe that's part of it. But how do you? How does the prodigal return? It's in his doing. Mm -hmm. And what did he get? A ring and a robe. Entitlement. Mm -hmm. He came back to do. Father, just let me be as one of your hired servants. Please give me something to do. And in that, the father, when that filled him, it broke out and manifest outwardly as entitlement. A ring and a robe, and a party. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? How God works. It's astounding! Yes. <laughs> There's humility here. Yeah. Humility in it. Well, you went low. Well, that's right. So. John 6, 35. He that comes to me shall never hunger. Hunger for what? They shall, if the hunger is met, by doing the will of him that sent you, then it implies it implies that you're going to, number one, know what you've been sent to do. Do what you've been sent to do. You're never, if he that comes to me shall never hunger and the, the meat is to do the will of him that sent you, you shall never want for an opportunity to do the will of him that sent you. Which means he obligates himself to see that you know what he's what telling he you to do. Yeah. And that you have the resources, the time, the opportunity, and the uh, stamina to do that. It's like, stick around with me, I'll keep you busy. That's what he's really saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll keep you so busy that the assignment of heaven will fill your life to overflowing, and the overflow will manifest as all the other things that you've been asking me for. Amen. That's what we're <laughs> and then Second Corinthians 3.18. The mirror, we look in the mirror and we see ourselves, think about it. My meat and my drink is to do the will of him that sent me. When you look in the mirror, you see what you've been eating. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Oh my. <laughs> Isn't that and the same is true. So think about it. We look into the word and you instantly identify the deficits. And the surplus of the doing of the will of God in your life. Mm. Wow. That's that is beautiful. one of the most powerful apostolic doctrines I've ever heard an apostle teach on. Thank you. Yes, it was very, very I, I just, I, I, We just put our ninth book out. 
It was based on the last conference we did where I, I always prepare messages in essay format. And we talked about opting in to apostolic culture. Process and outcome, opting into apostolic culture. And we just published that. And, uh, and it, that message was birthed right here in this meeting. Because Don started talking some stuff. Of course, he says things, and I hear all kinds of stuff added on to it. Yeah. That's the prophet in him. Yeah. But see, that's how that's the church, its first apostles, secondarily prophets, that's thirdly good. teachers. God intends for apostles and prophets to work together Absolutely. Like this. That's not how re Christianity does it. Christianity says, you know, there's only room at the top for one. But there's something that there's something to be said for plural anointing. Mm -hmm. yeah. The value yeah. of this. Mm -hmm. it is, since we've been doing this, it has completely shaped. <clears throat> so many of the things that I've written about, preached about, have been birthed right here. And listening to Papa Don. Amen. And just, it's so valuable. It's so much more joyful to do it this way, too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I don't forget, I mean, I can tell you things that Don preached on two years ago. I can talk about the impact it made because it had such a value, such a value to it. It was fresh bread. And like a couple, several weeks ago, the little lady speaks up and said God told her to move here from Texas because uh, that the Branson area is the navel of our nation. And That's God begins to talk to me about what is a navel. Mm -hmm. A navel is a mark Think about of it. your birth. A navel proves you have been born and that you weren't cultured in a test tube. That's sweet. And so, and it's, the Lord said, it's, it's one of the marks of the death of the Lord Jesus. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Well, we bear in our bodies the mark. In your belly button, that is the mark of your mother giving birth to you. Who's our mother? We've been born again. That is the mark of the Lord Jesus. Out of your belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. Out of what? Out of your belly, your belly button, which is the mark of the Lord Jesus in your life, your spiritual belly button. That's really good. Which is the well, and again coming back to Jesus saying he was the Son of Man, he's the tent stake, he's the point where heaven and earth come together, and a tent stake, the Vav, was the ancient symbol for where, and everywhere a well was on an ancient map, they would put a, a tent stake. And everywhere there was a well, it was also a symbol for priesthood because every well had a priest. So it was a dual symbol. It, it represented, you'll find a priest there, you'll find a well there. And, every, and so you're not just generally a priest unto God. No, you are a priest appointed like, like Moses' father-in-law was a priest at the wells of Midian. You are a priest over the specific well that God has put in your belly. And now, and if you, you guys are probably like me, I've had a lot of well water in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And you go from one well to another, I don't care if it's across the street, every well water tastes different. And what you got in your belly is a different uh, taste, a different testimony than what I have in my belly. That's right. Every believer is appointed over that what God put in their belly. One of the first th times God ever started talking to me about that, I had a friend of mine who was being manipulated by a false prophet. And this false prophet would like set you up and then he would tear you down. And he told this kid, he said, uh, your God is your, is your belly, which is a verse of scripture that says that. And the Spirit of God came on and he boomed back at me and says, my God is in my belly. <laughs> Thinking about out of your belly. And oh, I've never rivers. forgotten that. Rivers. And how it's not a belly. And <laughs> the Lord told me one time years ago, I was reading where my thoughts towards you are more than the sand of the sea. And I'm reading that like yada, yada, yada. And the Lord says, you don't believe that. I said, excuse me. I even believe the weather's genuine. And he said, you don't believe that. He said, that's not being poetic. He said, that's being very specific. I have more thoughts towards you than the sand in the sea. And boy, I repented because I honestly thought of myself as a low-level functionary in the kingdom of God and this huge cosmic bureaucracy.
that God maybe might have vestigially put his attention upon me at some point. And he really rebuked me for that in a good way. And then not long after that, he's talking about it. Out of your belly shall flow rivers. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. I get it. He said, no. He said, it's not a metaphor for a river. It is a river. And I've always lived most of my earlier adult life around the Mississippi. And the Corps of Engineers has been trying to tame the Mississippi since before I was born. And every time they think they have it tamed, it breaks out. And it only gets more untamable. And we've spent billions of dollars trying to tame the Mississippi. And so I know the power of the Mississippi River. And God's saying, out of you is coming something that's more powerful than the Mississippi River. Praise God. It's life-giving. And so out of these, and this just so speaks to me. I mean, you could take that, what Don talked about, and meditate on that. And it just gets deeper. It gets bigger. And deeper. And do you will. I want to be filled. I know you do too. Go ahead. 